Good afternoon to all of you joining us in Switzerland or from Europe, and good morning to our viewers connecting from the Americas. I'm Tatiana Gaspar, Managing Director of the Latin American Chamber of Commerce in Switzerland, and as always, delighted to host our newest webinar for you. We are focusing today on the International Finance Corporation, IFC, and its work in Latin America. We will provide an economic outlook as well as point out opportunities for the private sector. I'm very pleased and honored to introduce and extend a warm welcome to our guest speakers from IFC. Georgina Baker, Vice President for Latin America and the Caribbean, Europe and Central Asia. Welcome Georgina. Beatrice Maser, Special Representative for Western Europe. Hello, Beatrice. Martin Spicer, Regional Director for Latin America and the Caribbean. Welcome, Martin. And Jan van Bielsen, Country Manager for several Central European countries and Switzerland. Welcome, Jan. It is wonderful to have you with us today, everyone connecting from a different country and continent and we truly appreciate that you made time to share with our viewers your perspective. I'm also very happy to welcome two familiar faces, our trusted moderator and honorary ambassador of LATCAM, Dr. Philippe Nell. Hi, Philippe. Thank you. And the president of our chamber, Ramon Esteve. Hello, Ramon. Hello. You will everyone. address our, some special welcome remarks in just a minute. We are very grateful to have a sponsor for this virtual event, Ecom Agroindustrial, our president's company. Thank you so much, Ramon, for the generous support. Before handing over to you, I would like to make our audience aware that this webinar is as usual recorded. I will post the recording on our website and on our YouTube channel, LATCAM Switzerland. After the formal part and dialogue with our speakers, there will be time for Q&A. Please submit your questions in the Q&A section where I can pick them up. If you have concerns about privacy, you can do it anonymously. If you write it in the chat, be aware that everybody will see it. Now I'm pleased to hand over to you, Ramon. I believe you have some personal story that you would like to share with us. Well, welcome everyone and more than a personal story. I wanted to give you a little bit of a Swiss anecdote. Uh, on a Sunday afternoon in last year in September, the Swiss had just voted after a very passionate campaign. Uh, you know, they vote several times a year here in Switzerland on some new responsible business statutes. And a journalist called me up and asked, well, Mr. Esteve, what are you changing at the office on Monday, on Monday morning? And I said, well, nothing. He says, what do you mean nothing? I guess assuming the commodity trading companies would struggle with new human rights and environmental due diligence requirements. And I said, no, really nothing. We already have to comply with IFC performance standards, which cover pretty much the same due diligence and reporting requirements. And he goes, IFC, what's that? I say, yes, you know, the commercial arm of the World Bank. Then I realized that there was a bit of, of a knowledge gap if a Swiss business journalist was not aware of the ISC, the institution could be an interesting topic for a chamber webinar. So here we are. And I would like to thank Adam Struve and Jan van Bilsen for helping us organize this event. Our company trades agricultural commodities and we have been working since I, with IFC since 2005. And yes, everything you've heard about their due diligence process and their onboarding is true, which is why we were originally very reluctant until we were pushed in that direction by a key customer. Since then, they have been fantastic partners in geographies where normal banks will not tread. Uh, it is a bit their motto, we go where the commercial banks won't go. And it's not just lending. They have also provided us with technical assistance through their advisory services unit. We've had uh, development grants. We've had funding of our suppliers in Latin America, and now also in Africa and Asia. 
Today, all Swiss companies will have to address the new due diligence and reporting requirements starting next year. So IFC standards, performance standards should no longer be an impediment for anyone. You're gonna be doing it anyway. And I'd like to thank IFC for maybe giving us a 15 year head start in this area. Now, I do not want to step on the toes of our guest speakers, Georgina Baker, Beatrice Mazer, or Martin Spicer. I want to thank them also for being here. And I leave it to them to tell you about the advantages of working with IFC. To IFC, I would also like to say, Switzerland has some pretty amazing companies active in Latin America to explore opportunities with. And with that, this happy IFC customer would like to hand over the floor to our moderator, Dr. Philip Nell. Thank you very much, Roman, for your introduction. Indeed, uh, it was a brilliant introduction. You put us immediately, immediately into concrete, into what we want to talk about today. And uh, it was a very good example that you provided us. So I'm very pleased to moderate this webinar today with top executives at IFC. Our objective is to get IFC closer to Swiss business community by showing what IFC does and how could Swiss firms join some IFC activities. We will first look at IFC as a member of the World Bank Group, second at the economic outlook in Latin America, always important for business, third, IFC's investment in Latin America, and fourth, assess Swiss companies' interests to participate at IFC financed projects in three sectors. Let me now give a floor to Beatrice Marzer, IFC Special Representative for Western Europe at IFC in Paris, for a brief overview of IFC. Well, thank you very much and good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It's a great pleasure to be here with you this afternoon and thank you very much to the Chamber for organizing this event and giving us the opportunity uh, to present IFC. I will give you a brief introduction. Um, I think we have some slides. Tatiana, I think you're going to be pulling them up. Um, and uh, I'll give a brief introduction and then my colleagues Georgina Baker and Martin Spicer will zero in on uh, Latin America. So um, if you would like to go to this, if you would like to go to this next slide, the first one, next one, please. Yes. So um, IFC, next, the last one, please. Previous one. Thank you. Yes, so who is the IFC? I'm, I'm happy that we get the opportunity to present IFC. I guess we also have to work on the Swiss journalists a little bit more. But the IFC is um, the International Finance Corporation, belongs to the World Bank Group and focuses on the private sector in developing countries and emerging markets. Let's go to the next slide. IFC is the largest global development finance institution focusing exclusively on the private sector. It is headquartered in Washington, DC, but it has a global presence in more than 100 countries. So we have country offices in, in all continents. So we are very close um, to uh, the companies on the ground. Next slide. So what, what is the offer of IFC? On the one hand, on the left side, you see that we are providing investment, funding, financing. And on the right hand, you see the boxes that um, describe that we provide advisory services. As far as investment, we have a whole range of financial products. It's uh, debt and equity, but also trade finance, for example, tailoring it to the needs of um, the investments that we are financing. Along IFC, we invite other financiers, banks, insurances, institutional investors, and so on, to come in and uh, complement the financing that IFC is putting out, thus leveraging um, the financing of IFC. On the right side, we already heard Roman Esteve um, about the advisory services, for example, um, uh, advisory services to companies in the environmental and social um, standards um, sphere. We are also providing advisory services to companies um, in risk management or corporate governance issues. And we also provide advisory services to governments 
for example, to improve the business environment or how to open up the industry sectors in their country. So we provide advice to um, uh, develop the private sector in, in these developing countries. Next slide, please. Where do we invest? At currently, the portfolio stays at 61 billion US dollars. You see that in the middle. And on the left side, the pie chart shows the sectors. At the moment, almost half of the portfolio is invested in financial markets, financial institutions, insurances, and so on and so forth. But also then infrastructure, manufacturing, agribusiness, and services. And a very small part of the portfolio, but very active, is in disruptive technologies, new technologies, and funds. Um, so we have a whole range of, um, of um, products and, and industries that we are working in. And on the geographical distribution, you can see that we are pretty much everywhere across um, the different continents and very evenly distributed. Next slide, please. So what is the value added? And I think uh, Ramon Estevi already said it a little bit at the beginning, we are not just financing a project, we are also providing advice. Um, second, as I said, we are present in almost 100 countries. So we are very familiar with the environments, with the countries of where the investments take place. All these countries are also our shareholders. So there is a special relationship that IFC has developed with, with many different stakeholders uh, in the countries. We have a global sector expertise. We know how to structure transaction and we can uh, leverage uh, what we have learned in one, in one corner of the world, we can bring to another corner of the world. Next slide. And this will be the final, sli final slide. Um, IFC works with many different companies from all over the world, but also with Swiss corporates. So one of them is ECOM. Uh, we heard uh, Ramon uh, talking about um, how they work together with IFC, particularly also in the um, advisory uh, sphere. There are two examples we have on top. One is Barigaibo, um, the, the cacao manufacturer where we provided a supply chain finance and an advisory um, package to um, Barikaibo in Latin America and Asia. And another example, Credit Suisse in Mexico, where we provided funding to uh, mount some funds. In terms of the distribution uh, with the Swiss companies, the biggest portion is infrastructure. And um, in terms of geography, most of the Swiss companies have gone to Africa together with IFC and about 16% have been in Latin America. So with that, I would like to hand over the floor back to Philippe Nell, I guess, um, and looking forward to the discussion later on. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, thank you very much uh, for this um, very useful background on, on IFC. Uh, it enables us to see uh, major activities of IFC where and this IFC is invested also, and also the Swiss participation in IFC, which we see is being quite, quite uh, uh, substantial. Um, I would propose now to move uh, forward. And um, thank you very much, uh, Beatrice Marzo, for presenting us IFC. And I propose now to move to the uh, economic uh, outlook. Uh, following a very difficult year with a GDP fall of 7% for Latin America, a strong recovery is on the way. Uh, the key question is whether it is sustainable. I have the pleasure to give the floor to Martin Spicer, Director for Latin America and the Caribbean at IFC. You have the floor. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chris. Can you hear me okay? Yes, very well. Okay, thank you. Um, and thank you, Ramon, and thank you, Tatiana, also for inviting uh, us and, and me in particular to this uh, session to talk about Latin America and the Caribbean. And looking at those graphs that Beatrice just put up, I'd like to see that uh, lack chart graph get a little bit higher than 16% over the next few years. Um, so um, 
again, we're very grateful and, and look forward to engaging in further dialogue following up this, this event with any of the, the members of the Swiss Chamber or affiliates that uh, would, would like to. Um, just to reiterate, private sector investment is even more important today in LAC due to the fiscally constrained environment in, in many countries. And I'll, and I'll elaborate that in, in my presentation. Um, so I'm also gonna talk about how LAC countries are starting to recover from the pandemic after the deep reductions in economic activity in 2000, um, which was the highest of any region globally. Um, Philippe mentioned near 7%. Globally, the reductions were only 3.5%. So the region was affected much more uh, disproportionately compared to other regions. <clears throat> now I'll highlight some of the downside and upside risks that are facing the region and touch on some potential reforms that could pave the way for a stronger recovery and a more sustainable economic growth in, in LAC. Tatiana, can you put up my first slide, please? While that is happening, I will continue to, to talk to the slide. Um, so after a timid rebound in the first half of this year, the region is entering a phase of, of stronger economic activity. If you go to the second slide, Tatiana. The 2021 growth dynamics uh, respond in part to improvements in the external conditions and the gradual opening of the economies. With a few exceptions, mobility restrictions due to the pandemic are almost fully gone as the COVID waves start to subside. And vac vaccination plans, while a bit uneven, advance relatively well in LAC's largest economies. Households and businesses have adapted to living in a pandemic while the latest round of lockdowns have had much less of an impact on the activity than expected. Yet the ongoing uh, recovery is heterogeneous among countries and, and the region faces divergent growth prospects that still depend on the rollout of vaccines, the size of policy responses, their macro buffers and the economic structure. In the graph to the right here, you can see the difference in the recoveries of the commodity reliant countries, those more reliant on tourism and the group of, of other countries. Tourism countries have suffered more and will take longer to recover than the commodity reliant. Only a few will manage to surpass the, the pre-pandemic levels of growth this, this year, perhaps Brazil and Chile. Despite the better than expected performance of tourism in the first half of the year, growth in services output generally is expected to continue lagging industrial output growth in the short term. Looking at the chart on the left, here's an example of the heterogeneity across the region. We see Mexico's decline was nearly twice that of Brazil. And at 8.3 in Mexico and, and 4.1 in, in Brazil. And the reasons for this are twofold. One, the size of the fiscal stimulus. In Brazil, this was 15% of GDP, while in Mexico, only 1.9%. And second, the duration, timing, and the stringency of mobility restrictions. While stringency measures in Brazil have been less severe relative to Mexico, this has been at the expense of a higher death toll. Despite Brazil having some of the highest rates of new COVID-19 cases and correspondent related deaths, in per capita terms, the economy has remained relatively open. This combined with strong stimulus measures has kept activity and services relatively resilient. Looking at two other broad subregions, Central America and the Caribbean, we see that these two regions have had similar declines due to their similar nature of the structure of the economies or declines in trade, investment and consumption among the global recession have been similar and also the fallout in tourism general lockdowns and damages caused by natural um, events such as hurricanes, which affect both parts, countries in, in both of those regions significantly. One reason why South America here might be a little bit less impacted compared to, to Central America, sorry, Caribbean compared to Central America is the fact that Guyana, which has recently uh, uh, been discovered uh, oil reserves they had an extraordinary growth rate of 43.5%. Um, so this could explain part of that difference between those two similar regions. Next slide, please. 
The region is subject to a number of upside and downside risks as exemplified on this slide. The upside risks include recovery in commodity prices, which is increasing export and fiscal revenues in many LAC countries today. Faster control of the pandemic globally could also be an upside uh, benefit, as well as stronger than anticipated domestic policy support. In addition, a stronger rebound in the US and China could also support faster growth. And finally, a better than expected performance in the services sector could stimulate growth. It appears that citizens and visitors both are becoming more comfortable in resuming pre-pandemic behaviors, including in tourism and related industries, despite the ongoing certainties. Now, the situation is not without downside risks. COVID new variants are yet to fully enter the region and slower vaccine access. Some countries have disproportionate uh, access com compared to others. Fiscal pressures within a limited fiscal space, which I mentioned before, and, and medium term debt vulnerability are other downside risks. You can see the, the lack of debt levels in the top right chart compared to ECA, Europe, Central Asia region, and the MENA, Middle East and North Africa region. <clears throat> Inflationary pressures, also downside risks. If you look at the charts on the upper left and the lower right, you can see the impact on sectors and in the countries of uh, the inflationary pressure. The Fed's taper could also have an impact on interest and exchange rates going forward. Currency shocks in the bottom left chart from commodity price fluctuations and electoral uncertainty, which could also trigger central banks to engage in even tighter monetary policy. And finally, slow recovery of employment across the region is another downside risk. Next slide, please. Well, there are a number of reforms that both the World Bank and ourselves have identified that uh, would benefit the region, its economic and sustainable growth path. Um, to start with, structural reforms are needed to address the bottlenecks holding back productivity growth. These reforms include labor market flexibilization, improving the business environment, lowering entry barriers, strengthening institutions, and building capacity for improving provision of public good and services, such as infrastructure, education, health, and security. In addition, fiscal reforms for a sustainable recovery are needed, balancing short-term fiscal support while containing the increase in public debt over time. Also, climate. Recovery from the pandemic offers a unique opportunity for transformative change in how economies and societies are rebuilt to prepare for the challenges of a changing climate. Policy reforms are needed that promote investment in renewable energy, energy efficiency, climate smart buildings, low carbon public transport, and other needed systemic shifts to reduce GHG emissions. And finally, harnessing the digital transformation one of the most powerful instruments for increasing productivity, especially inclusive and sustainable productivity, is the digitization of our economies, the application of digital technologies to production processes. As digitalization affects every area of policy, every sector of the economy and all parts of society, a comprehensive agenda is required and why black countries need to develop national digital strategies that set out long-term vision to help people businesses, and institutions embrace the digital transformation. Next slide, and this will be my final slide. Well, I'd like to end with a few key messages and some thoughts on debt levels and risks of non-payment. Growth in LAC is expected to reach 5.2% in 2021, but investment in 2022 is still expected to return to only about the level where it stalled from 2016 to 2019. While external conditions have improved since the start of the year, key commodities have risen in price. The mobility restrictions, which were tightened in the first half of the year, had had an impact, but have recent, recently loosened in, 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 in the, the past months. Inflation has picked up. Most central banks in lack have already raised their benchmark interest rates, and the tightening cycle is expected to continue for the rest of the year. On public debt. Public debt has increased 10, 15% uh, in most countries and is expected to remain high. 
this will be a medium term challenge for many countries. While there is always a possibility of countries uh, defaulting on their debt obligations, we don't really see this as an immediate threat in lack countries, but more as a medium term risk. Although debt levels and fiscal vulnerabilities have increased sharply, countries are also now taking advantage of long-term maturity and low interest late rate loans, including those from multilateral financial institutions. Moreover, the recent allocation of SDRs by the IMF, about 650 billion, will provide additional liquidity support to countries with external financing needs. On the flip side, smooth access to foreign bond markets also raises concerns because debt denominated in foreign currency, as this may leave the corporate and public sector vulnerable to depreciation of domestic currencies. Thank you very much. Back to you, Philippe. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Martin, for your concise and um, very clear presentation. I would just uh, point to uh, three points. First, referring to the economic outlook. Uh, it looks promising for the coming couple of years. Referring to the risks, upside and downside risks, there are large uncertainties. And finally, uh, key reforms needed. It's a big agenda and uh, it will require resources and political support. But certainly there is a way forward and you have shown it. And thank you very much uh, for that. Further questions will be raised during the Q&A session with the audience. Uh, uh, now, uh, let, me, let me turn to um, uh, IFC investments in Latin America. Uh, to put our focus on investments in Latin America. In the fiscal year end of June 2020, IFC long-term investments in Latin America and the Caribbean um, reached a record of $7.1 billion, including uh, $4 billion mobilized from other investors. In this context, I would like uh, to ask a few questions to Georgina Baker, uh, Vice President, Latin America and the Caribbean in Europe, and Central Asia. Uh, Georgina, uh, in which sectors did uh, IFC invest funds? Thank you, thank you, Philippe. And um, I would just like to say thank you also to the Latin America Chamber of Commerce and Switzerland for inviting us to this meeting. It's, it's uh, very important to engage. So to your question, uh, which sectors did we invest? So our focus over the pandemic was to help the region recover. Um, we invested just under 11 billion across the, um, the, the time of the pandemic, 5 billion of which was in mobilization. And that was to what Beatrix pointed out earlier, of bringing in other people's money alongside ours. And 2 billion of that was short-term finance. Um, we also changed the way we worked. So we fast-tracked financing. We, we engaged with our existing clients. We said, how can we help you under the pandemic? What can we do to support you? Uh, can, we, can we give you financing now? And a lot of that money went to the manufacturing, agribusinesses, and service sectors. Um, uh, we also uh, fast-tracked our, our um, approvals to help the financial sector. Um, so our, but we didn't do so much in the infrastructure sector. Um, the, um, companies and, and governments were not investing in infrastructure, understandably, under the pandemic. So most of our investments uh, recently have been in manufacturing agribusiness and the financial sectors, but also in liquidity support. So we committed around 3 billion in liquidity to the region, um, trying to help SSME, MSMEs as they, they continue operations, support them, um, and, and export-oriented businesses. Um, we understand that uh, MSMEs have been hit the hardest, and that's why we worked with banks to extend credit so that banks could continue to operate and, and preserve jobs. Um, and we also supplied trade finance lines, as, as Beatrix uh, mentioned, um, that's one of our, one of our tools. And, we, and that was used in Latin America to purchase medical equipment and bring in medicines into several countries in, in Latin America. And then we continued with our standard uh, focuses, which is in making, trying to make the region's economies greener and, and supporting, for example, MSMEs in, in women-owned businesses um, who have always a, uh, a lack of, of access to, to finance. Um, and as, as Martin said, the role of the private sector is, is crucial um, and vast amounts of private sector money is needed to, to support Latin America. But these are the areas that we've been focusing on, on recently. Okay, yes, uh, thank, thank you very much. You just said now that uh, private sector money is needed and is very useful. Uh, could you give us an example how um, it fits together between your operations and uh, private sector money? Uh, thank you, Philippe. And, and 
one of uh, one of the nicest examples that I could I could come up with um, is a project called Amadeus. I'm forgive me, I can't remember why it's called Amadeus, but we all called it Amadeus. Um, maybe it's because it's sung to us. Um, but it was a joint venture between an Austrian company, Lensing, and a Brazilian company, Duratex, to build one of the largest, the world's largest uh, dissolving wood pulp plants in in Brazil. It was a 1.1 billion dollar project. Um, and the money was for supporting a cogeneration plant um, and, and the planting and sustainable management of around 70,000 hectares of eucalyptus plantations. Um, and we were very proud of this project because I think it, um, it illustrates the value that IFC can bring. It was a very large investment, 1.1 billion, um, and we mobilized the private investors who were comfortable coming into this because IFC was there. Um, they may have had concerns about, about the Brazilian economy, the Brazilian uh, legal system, the, the Brazilian markets, but alongside us, us they were comfortable coming into this. Um, but beyond the financing, our help in terms of the environmental and social protections, um, um, and a little bit like Ramon was talking about earlier, we enabled this plant to working with our clients to ensure that this was one of the most productive and energy efficient uh, plants in the world. Um, with IFC as a partner, this, this project became a truly climate smart project um, to support the forestry sector, crucial to Brazil's economy, which represents, represents about 4% of uh, the country's exports. Um, and created, uh, strengthened the competitiveness of, of Brazil's uh, pulp industry, created jobs, supported the country's uh, efforts towards climate uh, change mitigation. Um, and a, a different kind of example from a manufacturing project like that would be um, uh, an example we did with the banking in the banking sector. Uh, we worked with Global Bank in Panama to create the first ever um, uh, mortgage specifically uh, targeted to women. Um, many of us that have started our own businesses will know that, you know, to, when you've got an idea, you need financing, you either go to the bank, to the bank of family and friends, or you can uh, raise money against your house in terms of um, a mortgage. Um, uh, this, the bank in, global bank in Panama recognized that that, that was uh, not available to women in that country because they don't have access, they lack the real estate collateral that financial institutions require for loans. Um, and uh, we created with this bank a, a, a mortgage bespoke for women. Um, and uh, using IFC's global coverage, we will be able to take this idea, take it across Latin America, and in fact, in fact across all of our markets, um, uh, because it met the needs of the women in Panama, and I think it'll be just as useful for, for women elsewhere. So those are two examples. Uh, I hope, hope to help our, our audience understand the kinds of investments we make. Oh, thank you very much. I think it is very illustrative and it shows that it is finance, it's also environment, it is social protection, uh, it is job, it's the whole development process which is uh, behind uh, uh, behind that and in a couple of year, in a couple of words you face so many challenges when you set up uh, these big projects and these corporations. Uh, could you um, mention a couple of challenges you face? I mean, there are many, many opportunities to invest in, in Latin America, um, but we need to, to stay true to our charter, which is to, to further development growth, to create jobs, to create, um, and not, not to displace uh, the private sector that may be, be operating in, in, in already. Um, so we have to be, make sure that we are, we are true to our, to our, um, to our mandate. Um, it was very interesting to hear Ramon talk so positively about the, our environmental guidelines, um, because many times, the standard, our standards are higher than those that our clients use and bringing them along, along with us um, and feeling that these are important can be uh, a, 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 an issue that they recognize once they have become clients, but are less so perhaps when they are becoming our clients. Um, and if I can go back to the Amadeus example, it was interesting there. We, we worked with the, the sponsors, um, the Brazil and the, the Austrian um, Swiss company to, um, to say that we really need to do best in class water filtration. So the plant uh, was, down, was upstream of the local town. And uh, if, if the pollution from the plant, uh, the, the, the wood pulp dissolving plant, so there's chemicals involved in that, got into the water supply of the town, it would give the, the, the plant enormous social issues. So we said, let's well, we advise you invest in the best in class water filtration because we know that, that will protect you later on from any downside risks. 
And, and eventually they saw that that was the right thing to do and they worked with us. Um, so we felt that our advisory and our advice on this issue was, was, was paramount, but sometimes um, clients are not always willing to spend more to mitigate a risk that is uh, further down the line. But we, we believe that we offer, a, a, this is one of our, our strengths and it was, you know, so it was very nice that Ramon was able to pick up on this. Thank you. Okay, yes, thank you very much. Uh, I think you, you gave a very interesting example which, which uh, shows us that we have to look forward you have to look at what could come as a major problem, water filtration, and then social issues linked to that. So these are part of the challenges that you face, certainly in many big projects uh, that you do support. Uh, now, um, dear audience, we are already moving to the fourth part uh, of our webinar. Time is really running quickly because it is just so uh, interesting. We have uh, really great speakers tonight in Switzerland. And uh, we are going to have uh, five minutes for three sectors to discuss. And what we want to focus on is um, Swiss companies' interest to participate in IFC finance projects. Uh, Swiss firms are very active in Latin America with more than $30 billion uh, in investment. And they are active in pharmaceuticals and medical devices, um, in machines and transportation, uh, in, in equipment, in, in food, in, in mining, uh, in services, uh, including finance, insurance, and logistics. Uh, uh, let me uh, first uh, turn to um, now to, um, to Martin uh, to look with him at the health sector. Uh, Swiss firms play an important role in alleviating health problems uh, across Latin America with special programs facilitating access to medicine. Now, uh, what projects uh, and specific operation did IFC finance recently in this field in Latin America? So, so thank you, Philippe, for that question. As, as many of you know, the pandemic has put additional stress on national health systems and in particular movement of supplies to those in need where production today is not happening uh, as much in each country as it is more centralized in, in specific producing countries. And so one thing that we are trying to, to do is support um, local companies and investors in, in the, the LAC countries to create production capacity, whether it's on medical uh, equipment or disposables or medicines. Um, and this is important to reduce the shipping times that it takes to get products to um, consumers here for healthcare. Um, and <clears throat> when you look at Latin America, depending on the country and the production in the pharmaceutical area, um, maybe only 30% of the pharmaceuticals are produced in country, 30 to, to 50%, 50% in the countries with, with, with more. Um, production, um, which which is uh, uh, demonstrates the need to have local production capacity. So one of the examples uh, the, the last year that we financed is a company called Neo Pharma, which is in Mexico. And Neo Pharma is focused on research and development, manufacturing, distribution, and the commercialization of generic uh, drugs. And even this Mexican company is exporting to ten countries throughout the region. Um, and it, it reaches about 8,000 small and independent stores throughout Mexico it, itself and it's the distribution network. Um, and one, one thing we're trying to do is support companies that are based in one country and also exporting to, to, to nearby countries. And we're able to provide financing solutions, particularly in, the, in this case that, that helps with local currency financing in those countries of expansion, helping those companies know those other countries better and they might know their own home, home country. Um, and another related activity we're doing is with a group that we call Tech Emerge. And this group with NIFC tries to match up newer companies with newer technologies with more established companies. And so we create these um, events, today virtual and the past in, in, in person that try to connect um, the newer companies with newer solutions with established companies. And one area related to this health sector is this cold supply chain and the need for having reliable temperature controlled logistics throughout the, mm -hmm. the distribution period of these, uh, these, these drugs. And what we try and do is to 
set up a, a sustainable cooling program in Mexico and Colombia, specifically uh, uh, focused on, on this area to help pilot scalable and sustainable cooling solutions to, to maximize the, the impact. And this is just one way kind of related to our advisory work or being a for, creating a forum for people to come together, which I think could be a, a valuable to, to, to Swiss companies as they start to look at, at the, the LAC region. I'll, I'll stop there, thanks. Okay, yes, uh, thank you very much. Uh, so the way I understand it, uh, if we would like to uh, strengthen the cooperation between IFC and the Swiss pharmaceutical and uh, life science sector, uh, maybe um, we should uh, provide to um, um, uh, Swiss, uh, uh, the Swiss Association for Pharmaceuticals um, information on IFC, on what you have been doing, and with that, they could, you know, transmit it to their companies because it's highly specialized, you know, it's not something you're going to improvise. Uh, it's based really on great knowledge and technicity, but also there are some needs and there are some possibilities. Swiss companies also do a lot of um, um, uh, phase three testing uh, in, in Latin America, in various countries, and they cooperate closely with hospitals and also with uh, uh, local local companies. So there, there certainly could be some margin for things to be to, to, to be done. But I believe the first step would be uh, for IFC to be in touch with science industries, which is the association in Switzerland that um, uh, looks at uh, all the horizontal issues and opportunities uh, for the Swiss uh, pharmaceutical sector. We have also the MedTech Association for Medical Devices. So thank you very much. And uh, I may like now, to turn to, to Georgina, um, machines and trains and cable cars is also a very important sector. People are moving all the time, all the time um, to go to their job and um, to go to watch a football game and, and whatever. And uh, what could you tell us about um, your projects, for instance, on cable cars in Latin America? Thanks, Philippe. I'm, I'm always super excited to talk about this project because I, I like it so much. Um, and it's very nice to be able to talk about it to this audience because uh, it's a Swiss, Swiss engineering that helped us implement the project and SECO uh, was incredibly helpful in terms of advisory work um, leading into the project. So I'm, I'm really grateful for the opportunity to talk about it. But maybe I could take a step back and, and say that we do see infrastructure as one of the, the key drivers for the region's sustainable development. Um, you know, the fiscal positions of countries um, has deteriorated, but the inf infrastructure gaps um, remain. Um, and so narrowing that gap has become more and more challenging. Um, <clears throat> urban transport, uh, because there's so much, uh, Latin America being one of the most reg urbanized uh, regions in the world, urban transport is front and center for IFC, um, and there is tremendous potential there for, for private sector investments, um, as is working with the municipalities. So we supported the Transmicad uh, cable car project, and that was on the, the, uh, the photograph that was on the invitation to this, to this uh, event. Uh, it was part of a $140 million financing package that, that we invested with the, the city of Bogota, and this followed a, a three-year advisory program. So IFC is very much an institution that does a lot of upfront work to make sure that we have all the pieces in place before we invest. Um, and that invest advisory program was implemented in partnership with the, the Secretary, State Secretariat for Economic Affairs in, in Switzerland, uh, SECO. And, and, and a big thank you, a big, big thank you to SECO for your, your support here. We could not have done this without you. So a three-year advisory program um, to uh, look at the environmental impact of, of the project. But, but most importantly, this was a, a life changer for the people that used it. So <clears throat> for those, those of you that don't know Colombia and don't know Bogota, Bogota is a very high city, uh, but it has mountains on a two if not three sides. Um, and in, in, in the mountains is where the, the, the high, high hills are, where the favelas are, where the poorer people live. Um, uh, the 200,000 people that were in this, uh, the area that was served by the, the, this one cable car would take around an hour and a half every day to come down from their homes, down to the, the plateau where the main city is, to, to, to interact with the municipal bus system, an hour and a half to get down and then an hour and a half home. And that's not including the, the time that they would take to, to use the municipal buses to, to get to their place of work. Um, the cable car has reduced that to 15 minutes. And so people would say, and I, we see these incredibly moving videos, 
people saying you've given me three hours of my life back three hours that I can now spend with my children with my family um, um, we eat better now instead of late at night I engage with my children uh, over their homework um, you have given me three hours of my life back it's in incredibly moving because they used to travel through small little private buses um, on unmade up roads it would take forever um, or you'd get on the back of someone's motorbike um, and get a, get down it was it was very dangerous and difficult um, and this cable car has has changed their lives so much for the better. I visited uh, in one of my recent trips to uh, pre-pandemic to, to Bogota, and I, I, I journeyed on the, on the cable car with a woman who had uh, set up and been part of the municipality when they set up the program, but hadn't visited for, for, for 12, uh, 10 months. Um, and she told me two stories. Firstly, that when her government, um, the government she worked for, took over from a previous government, they, they took a look at this project that had not yet been implemented and said, you know, we want to make some changes. And the people, uh, these 20,000 people who were being affected were very upset. What do you mean? Are you going to, you're going to dismantle this project? And they're like, no, we want to improve it. We want first best in class cable cars. We want cable cars with cameras and lighting so that women can take these cable cars and feel safe late at night. We want big cable cars um, that can take prams with children or, or bicycles. We want the best. And it, she said it was incredible how the, the people responded. They had felt, the people in the favelas had never felt that their government, their municipal government, had put them in such high regard. They were willing to spend on the best cable cars, the best Swiss cable cars, um, to help them get to their place of work. Um, and that meant that they invested in, in their environment. Um, so the, the municipality invested in the, the land surrounding each um, cable car stop. There were like five of them up the mountains um, and you know, those were nicely grassed or, or um, paved, but the people themselves invested in their surroundings. They, they painted, they painted their roofs that people now see as they go over their houses. Um, they painted the outside of their buildings. So when you step back, it looks like a, a butterfly's wing. It's so colorful, it's beautiful. But their pride in their own place now is huge. So we really changed the mentality. Um, and and, it's, and it's, it's just, it's wonderful. It's wonderful to see. Um, and, and we did this investment, not only was, it was the Swiss cable, car, cable cars, um, but also a, uh, an Austrian Swiss company, a market leader in ropeway engineering that got the construction contract. So um, this is, this is uh, uh, a, 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 a landmark transaction in, in, in Bogota. Um, because of, of the, its success, the city is now conducting feasibility studies for two more. Um, and, and it is being looked at around by other cities with uh, similar um, locational issues by other, by other cities in Latin America. So I hope that's gonna be a huge boost to the, uh, to the Swiss cable car uh, industry. Um, and, and, and again, thank you, SECO, which has been a huge partner for us in our, our work with our cities program in Latin America, um, as well as with the, the work they've done with us in climate change and financial inclusion. Sorry, Philippe, I just had to put in a, a plug there for SECO because we're so grateful for their, for their support. Um, back to you now. Okay, uh, thank you very much, uh, Georgina. I will certainly relay your comments to my former colleague at the Swiss Secretariat of Economy. And uh, um, uh, it is impressive to see that at the beginning, cable cars were built in Switzerland for our guests from Great Britain were coming to spend their holidays in the mountains. And now we are building much, much more many uh, cable cars uh, in all parts of the world, including in Latin America, in order to help people, as you say, to gain three hours in their, in their day uh, to, to move. Um, so I think from what you said, uh, we, we can see that there are great opportunities in Latin America on cable cars, but you have experience on that and also in other transportation means and that certainly companies can address to you, to the IFC, in order to see where to do what and work um, together with you. Now, finally, we have a, another few minutes. I could turn to Martin again to look at um, a major area in which IFC is active. Uh, this is the area of agricultural products and in particular commodities such as coffee, cocoa, sugar. Um, IFC works with local communities and small uh, small farmers to improve productivity. Uh, could you give us um, 
a very short uh, flash on uh, what you are doing in this area and in particular how you work with um, uh, companies uh, which then buy uh, these uh, these products to further process them we saw that Barry Cabello is one of the companies uh, which is working with IFC uh, for instance uh, uh, so the floor is yours Martin thank you for it yes so with Barry Cabello we've been working um, with their suppliers in, in Mexico um, and what we try to do is help our clients, which are usually larger companies, the traders or producers, with their relationship with the smallholder producers, the, the smaller farmers. And that's where our development interests lie, but also in trying to help make sure that those small farmers are producing sustainably, are, are getting a fair income for what they produce, and that the, the quality is good so that the buyer of those products is benefiting also. And so this is what we've helped Barry Caribo to do by, by providing trade finance in the form of trade finance. And actually this is a program that Georgina started uh, over a decade ago um, where we make those farmers eligible for discounted rates on short-term working capital financing. Um, and, and that's contingent on those smaller farmers' uh, uh, sustainability standards uh, and, and the companies that we work with, like Barry Calibo, on labor, health, and, and safety, and environmental performance. So there's a link and an incentive in the financing structure, which comes down to real dollars and cents that benefit uh, to, to, to get those sustainability practices uh, working. And... and um, um, <clears throat> So why don't I stop there? I think that's a good cap, capsule of a, of a company and that effort of connecting development, sustainability with good business from larger global companies. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I think you made some very useful points uh, here, in particular on emphasizing IFC and, um, and trade finance and short-term finance. Indeed, those farmers quite often do not have the mean in order to, to finance buying uh, the seeds for the next crops. And here you do play a key role that enables them to uh, develop their activity. And uh, these activities in, in coffee and cocoa, it's very important to keep farmers on the land in Latin America because the younger generation now quite often would like to prefer, prefer to go to live in, 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 the, in the cities uh, so that uh, your work and also the work of um, the, uh, the companies who are buying uh, these, uh, these commodities is uh, extremely important and useful. And as I understand, as I understood also from uh, Roman Esteve from Ecom, uh, companies can contact you at IFC, either in Paris or in Washington in order to see why you're active and what you do and how can they join into some of your programs because it is a win-win. Uh, this being said, I think we could go to the Q&A session and we will have a few minutes for that. So I'm going to pass the word back to Tatiana who certainly has received a few questions from the audience. But Tatiana, back to you. Thank you, Philippe. And we have one question here from Linda Walker, our Vice President. Do you work with the IDB? And if so, on what type of projects? Why don't I answer that question? Yes, we do. And we work with other um, bilateral development banks as, as well from... Uh, mainly from from Europe. Usually, it's in larger projects. That uh, so this means often on infrastructure, where the financing needs are are large, and no one of us on our own is able to uh, provide all the financing necessary. And these projects tend to be in some of the more challenging countries um, uh, as well. So in Central America, you would see a number of engagements where where we go jointly, or in larger projects and. In a, in a country like uh, Mexico or uh, in, in Brazil. And so thanks. Thank you, Martin. Um, I have a question here from Enrique Revasa. Improve infrastructure is a must, but in our countries like Peru, we need first to broke, break corruption and false political interest to reduce these infrastructure gaps. How do you work this to rush these investments? So in the infrastructure area, in addition to the financing, we also 
provide advice to governments for the tendering of public-private partnership projects. And in the structuring of those tendering processes, we try to ensure that the, the risks of corruptive practices are, are, are eliminated from, from the tender and the awarding process. And, and so this is the way that we try to ensure before the projects are ready for financing that, that all financiers will be happy with the, the fact that the cor corruption is not the part of those. And then when we look at projects on our own, we have a very rigorous for financing, a very rigorous process of evaluating the integrity risks of, of both our clients and also the, the governments that have awarded these. And, and these, these practices and the issues that your, your member mentions here are real and prevalent across the region and they require a lot of diligence on our part also on the part of the, the, the World Bank, which gets involved also in trying to minimize corruptive behaviors. Um, and so it's a, it's a constant diligence that we need to, to be, be making. Thank you. The next question comes from an anonymous viewer. Currently, how does the IFC perceive Peru and work with the government? The public sector has for years not been able to implement the necessary infrastructure, so connectivity issues truly improve, like a cable car in Bogota. Limiting private sector investments, could you share your thoughts, ideas, recommendations? So with the political change in the country, um, we are continuing to, to stay involved, speaking with uh, past clients and existing clients to ascertain their needs for financing or dealing with the opportunities that, that uh, are arising. As I said before, private sector will be essential in every country to help with economic development. And, and so we have some advisory engagements, for instance, in, in the uh, school sector in, in Peru to try and help with the reconstruction of primary and secondary schools in, in the capital of Lima and looking at the water sector and some of the agribusiness sector as potential areas of, of competitive advantage for Peru and, and where we should be able to help with the financing of, of new projects. Thank you. Now there's a question from Suzanne Lauberfürst. Excellent webinar, thank you. You showed large company projects how can Swiss SMEs access support from IFC for agroclimate insure tech solutions? Focus on smallholders. And what is your advice to find the best partners? Would the tech eMERGE group mentioned by Martin Spicer be an option also for our sector? So yes, I think the tech eMERGE could be uh, of interest. I'd be happy to connect her with the appropriate people in, in IOC that are, are part of that. Um, also, what we find is providers of services, providers of uh, equipment, the more familiar they are, you are with financing options for your clients. And so this webinar hopefully has made you more familiar with, with IFC, letting your clients know about IFC as a potential source of funding for larger projects that might involve some of your own engagements with those companies would be another uh, way or form for us to connect uh, through a similar client. Um, could be some possibilities also through, if you have local operations and, and are, are seeking funding locally to connect with banking uh, clients of IFC. Nearly half of our portfolio is with commercial banks and providing funding for SMEs and uh, SMEs that have a climate focus uh, would be a potential area to, to help connect you to financing, maybe not directly from ISC, but with funds from ISC that are going through commercial banks. But if I may add also, we have Jan van Bilsen on the call and, and he is responsible for uh, connecting IFC to uh, Swiss companies. And so he will be the first port of call for anyone who wanted to, to explore whether IFC could uh, financing could be uh, valuable to them. Just wanted to add to what you were saying, Martin. No, happy, happy to do so indeed. Um, yeah, so as IFC, I mean, given the footprint that we have and the development impact um, focus that we have, 
that is a kind of a proxy for development impact and the size. Uh, and um, uh, as I said, given the size that we have, there is a tendency to focus on more medium-sized, larger projects indeed. So we work um, um, <clears throat> actively with uh, banks um, in emerging markets. Uh, we have a network of about uh, five, 600 banks who we provide um, uh, loans for them to on-land to, uh, let's say, medium-sized or smaller uh, companies. Uh, so that is basically, uh, basically one way. Um, what we do anyway is that through the offices that we have in 100 countries, that we can indeed provide information to any client. So therefore, if indeed you have an interest for an investment in a particular country, do contact us um, and we can bring you in touch with our country managers in those countries, who are often uh, locals from those countries, have been around for many years, and have a host of experience in terms of uh, you know who is who, uh, who to contact, uh, what are the pitfalls, what are the challenges, the opportunities, etc., um, and also to bring you in touch perhaps with um, perhaps with others. So it depends very much on what it is. And when you say basically SMEs, often indeed SMEs, it depends on what it is. So in certain countries, SMEs are still fairly large, medium-sized companies, right? Uh, and if you team up with a local partner, which is quite useful in many of these countries anyway, then perhaps uh, you know the, the, the total project size can still be uh, such that the ESRFC uh, can warrant to have a direct investment. But definitely, I mean, by all means, uh, do pick up the phone, send us an email, we are willing to uh, engage and bring you in touch with others and see how we can help. Okay. Thank you, Jan. Well, there's one question I spotted. Um, I will read it. It's, I think, anonymous, or I can't see from whom. What are your views on the political turmoil in the region, not only Peru? Don't know if you want to elaborate on that at all. Very quickly, um, the region goes through cycles over time, and we're going through a cycle now where there's a number of political uh, presidential elections in the next six to, to nine months, which is stimulating um, some of this activity. A lot of participation by civil society, which is good and disruptive at the same time. Um, and, uh, you know, what will remain is the, the need for economic growth, employment. And, and so our focus as IFC is con continuing to, to invest and, and support existing and new clients to, to make investments that increase productivity, competitiveness, and, and create those jobs uh, for the future. Thank you, Martin. I have no more question. I can see that we have lost uh, Philippe. Probably his connection um, is just lost for a moment. Uh, Ramon, would you like to add the last sentence before we wrap it up? Well, besides thanking IFC, uh, really not. I think uh, the comments we're getting, uh, our audience really appreciated this seminar. I'm happy you could put together such a big panel with different views on the different things you do. Um, and uh, I think it's important to stress that it's not only financing, the advisory services have been excellent. And uh, we will all be facing environmental issues in a very near future. And I think IFC can, can really help there. And, uh, um, you know, and maybe fund the, the advice they're giving you after that. But no, that, that's, about, uh, that's about it for me. Again, thank you to, to Georgina, to uh, Martin, to, to uh, Beatrice uh, and, and Jan for putting this together. Adam also, who's not on the panel, but who made the initial contacts to make this uh, possible. Um, I hope we have another one like this. Uh, <laughs> so we can measure impact of our first seminar. <laughs> Thank you very much for inviting us. It's been a real pleasure. And hopefully, let's bring those 16% up, as Martin said. Yeah. Now, one hour literally flies by. And uh, if you had such a diversified spectrum of discussion topics, but um, yes, we have really reached the end of this webinar now. 
And in the name of LATCAM, I would like to thank once again uh, and express our deep appreciation to our guest speakers, Georgina Baker, Beatrice Maser, Martin Spicer, and Jan van Bielsen. Thank you for providing us with a wealth of compelling insights and colorful perspectives and storytelling. Many thanks also to Philippe for the diligent and in-depth preparation and moderation of this webinar. And once again, thank you Ramon and Ecom Agroindustrial for being today's sponsor. Dear viewers, we hope that you have enjoyed and profited from your participation today. If you want to engage in a new cooperation with IFC and need a contact, please let us know. It has been a great pleasure and I look forward to our next time together. Till then, keep safe and goodbye. Goodbye, thank you, Tatiana. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.